And so I want to pick your brain a little bit for the viewers about Abraham silence. Can you give just like a, a third, your quickest way, how you would describe somebody watching this program who's hasn't heard about your book? What's the one sentence or two sentence summary of what you're trying to say in it? You know, that's, that's hard. It's a little bit, <laughs> it took me a while to figure out what's the unity of this book. Mm -hmm. So the book addresses the question of what is your stance towards God in a time of suffering? Mm -hmm. And it takes you through the Lament Psalms and the book of Job to finally end with the question, why does Abraham in chapter 18 of Genesis protest God's destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, mm -hmm. God's planned destruction, but does not protest when God says, kill your own son. So Abraham's silence stands out like a sore thumb against the background in the Bible that God wants a vigorous dialogue partner. Mm -hmm. So it, it's both a theological pastoral study of how we should pray in times of suffering and an exegesis of the books of Job and Abraham's um, the Akedah in Genesis 22. That's what I found so fascinating about it was it was like a mini Job commentary and also a commentary, not, not really a commentary, but a survey of the lament Psalms and the passages of lament in scripture. And then a discussion, a, a kind of zoom in focus on the incident between uh, at Mount Moriah with the Akira. It was that I'd never seen those linked together the way you did. And, and, that's what I really did appreciate that about it. When I when I look at, and this is what I want, I'd like to hear your thoughts. When I, in evangelical churches, whether they're liturgical, high church, or more contemporary, you know, kind of like a, a somebody said a, a Coldplay concert and a TED talk. Um, <laughs> the, when I go to either, there's the one thing that both are missing is genuine lament, and. And, and the crying out that you can't, you can hardly turn a page in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, without seeing someone or readings yeah. about someone crying out to God authentically. Yeah. Why do evangelical churches, do you think, have such an allergic reaction to lament when it comes to corporate gatherings? That's a great question. It's a great question. So I think it has to do with a couple of things. Um, we tend to think that we live in a New Testament era when Christ is raised from the dead and we have victory in Jesus. Mm -hmm. So the victory means we can't be honest about where we're still in the valley. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but, you know, there, there is a wonderful book on lament in the New Testament called Jesus Wept by Rebecca Eklund was okay. her dissertation. And she's written a shorter version of that. Um, what is it called? Something lament. I forget what the verb is. It's a Whitman stock book, Cascade um, companion's book. So the New Testament also has lament. And when you read the passion story of Jesus, the gospel writers have interwoven lament psalms the whole way through because they have taken things like Psalm 2 and Psalm 110, which speak of God anointing his, his you know, king on Zion and all the nations will submit, which is the kind of messianic motif. And I said, that only applies to Jesus after the resurrection. But before the resurrection is the lament psalms. He is the, mm. the righteous sufferer who unjustly suffers and cries out to God on the cross, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And God intervenes to raise him from the dead. So we falsely jettison the Old Testament and think we live in the victory of the new, not understanding it's a complex process. So for at one level, it's bad biblical interpretation. Mm -hmm. But at another, another level, it's we have imbibed our culture, which is a culture which cannot look pain in the face. It wants, you know, quick, 20 second solutions to everything. Mm -hmm. And that's the way we think. And so we are, un we're uncomfortable. Um, uh, Prince Philip, who you know passed away a while back now, mm -hmm. um, last year, I think, said that he used to go in, in lines where people are shaking hands, they would say, how are you? He'd say, my mother just died. They'd say, oh, that's very nice and walk on because nobody's listening for your pain. He would test mm -hmm. it that way. And I've tested that in church, you know. I, mm -hmm. How are you? I'm really crappy today. Oh, that's really nice. And they move on. Or sometimes they stop. What? I mean, mm -hmm. somebody was being honest for once, you know? Mm -hmm. So we're not used to being honest for a lot of complex reasons. Mm -hmm. I have done lament services in church, and it opens people up to pain and to tears, but also to hope. Because to know that you are in a tradition, a community, going back thousands of years of people who cry to God with their pain, and God embraces that and wants that, that says, 
my pain is not an aberration that mm -hmm. I should suppress. There is actually uh, the God I believe in is more merciful and loving and compassionate than I ever imagined. He wants me to bring my pain to him, both in private, but also in communal worship. I mean, these Psalms were sung in communal worship in the temple at some point, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. they were. They, it really, I mean, the, the past few years, especially, this has stayed in my mind, my discomfort with churches. And, and I'm not bashing church. I, I'm a preacher's kid. Mm -hmm. I'm born and raised in the church. This is definitely an in-house critique, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it, it fr it's, it's angering me the, the, the longer it goes that churches don't see the redemptive benefit of lament. I mean, even the most basic counselor knows when somebody has a good cry and just bawls their eyes out after that, there's a sense of relief and a sense yeah. of healing that just naturally happens because of mm -hmm. the release. And so in all, you did campus ministry. I did campus ministry before seminary at, at the Wesley foundation at university of Georgia. We were, we, we, it still is the largest campus ministry in the country. And we would have, at, when I was there, we'd have 400, 500 students a week. Now they're up to, I don't know, 1,000 or 2,000. But we sang some amazing songs. The worship band, this was in the late 90s. They were, it was starting to play some of the contemporary stuff. But there was one song I remember. It was, it was called There Must Be More. And the whole song was just a cry of, God, there's got to be more than what I'm experiencing because I'm beat down, I'm tired, I'm weak, I need your grace to work in me. And that's it, there was no happy ending, there was no nothing. That's the only song right. in 25 years now in a church corporate setting that I've heard that, that expressed that kind of pain. Right. And I still wonder like, why, why, hasn't, why haven't more churches keyed in on this? churches that should and that do know better when it comes to counseling or yeah. funeral services. I, you know, I've been to churches and, and part of church that does amazing funerals. They, they really do see funerals as a ministry and, and they're everything a funeral should be, but yet you're never going to get that depth of, of pain ever expressed on a Sunday morning. Right. And that's what it's still, and I'm not picking on any one particular church. That's in my own experience, spans churches. Yeah, yeah. I didn't, I did not grow up appreciating poetry. Uh, I was a purely visual artist and, and music I can appreciate. I just wasn't good at it. But poetry, I just never, it wasn't my thing. And I realized English poetry isn't my thing. But when I started learning mm. biblical poetry, especially when I learned Hebrew, uh, when I started to learn Hebrew, I should say, I, I consider myself still always learning Hebrew, but I started being able to appreciate poetry for what it is structurally and how it communicates things in mm -hmm. a somewhat mm -hmm. abstract, but very specific way. And the poems in the Bible, like a third of them have to, it has to be a third at least are lament and are anger or frustration with God or begging God to act. Um, do you think that, do you think that part of the reason that Christians, evangelical Christians shy away or, or kind of run away from that has to do with a prosperity mindset or a name? Like, I don't want to, I, you hear a lot. I don't want to speak negativity. I don't want to speak negativity. I want to speak positive. And I've heard preachers say, when the psalmist says, praise the Lord, oh, my soul, and they make a point, that's an imperative. You have to tell your soul to praise the Lord because your soul wants to be sad. And so you have to make your soul cheer up and praise the Lord and this and that. What do you, as an Old Testament or biblical scholar, what do you, what do you think of any of that? Well, you know, that's that kind of exegesis, that kind of biblical interpretation is like when you're doing the, um, the, you know, the man who fell among robbers. He says, a certain man went down to Jericho. You know, are you certain, brother? You know, I've heard those sermons. I heard those sermons as a teenager, you know. <laughs> you I've never heard that example, oh, yeah, but that's yeah, a that's brilliant it. example. <laughs> so, you know, you can read all kind of foolishness into and out of the Bible if you really want. But when you look at the pattern of Scripture, it takes mm -hmm. sin and suffering seriously and doesn't always say suffering as a result of sin. So there's nothing wrong intrinsically with articulating suffering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, yeah, praise the Lord, oh, my soul. But, you know, there are... Yeah, I could get into. I don't want to get into all the details of this stuff. I'm going to let you guide me with a question. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. I yeah. I just one thing I I want Christians, especially evangelical Christians, to 
to do more is sit with that suffering. Okay, so we've only got, I want to keep you a few more minutes. Uh, the last question that I had, page 197, you give an example of God testing Abraham, and it wasn't uh, basically in order to get the response that Abraham ended up giving, but rather to test him in the way, I think you say a teacher would test a student and say, now I know you're a C student. But that doesn't mean the teacher wants the student to be a C student. They, they maybe tested them hoping that they would be or wanting them to be an A student. So two-part question is, one, can you kind of unpack that example a little bit in God's response to Abraham? And two, a viewer, uh, a follower on Facebook actually included this question, was if the ancient Near East gods were so capricious and arbitrary and demanding of sacrifices, including even living relatives, firstborn children, all that stuff. When God asked this of Abraham, would Abraham may have, would it may have been a little less shocking to Abraham than it is to us today, even though it still would have been shocking regardless? Yeah, yeah. Uh, or do you think that's inconsequential that no matter how you slice it, it, it was a crazy, ridiculous request to begin with on God's part, well, and that's how we're supposed mm -hmm. to read it. I think that viewer has some significant insight there, which is going to help me clarify um, what the test is about. Mm -hmm. So Abraham is a member of Mesopotamian society coming from Ur of the Chaldees. Now, Ur of the Chaldees is an anachronism um, because Ur is an ancient Sumerian city, and the Chaldees are a later ethnic group that rules Babylon in the time of Nebuchadnezzar. So, it, you know, it's... It, whatever, it's a later period is putting this together. He comes from that area and his family journeys to Haran in um, Syria, northern Syria, and then he comes down into, into um, Canaan. Now, this God who has called him to come, does he know much about this God? No, he's learning. God wants to shape Abraham and his descendants to be a unique people, to bear his name, to use Carmen's idea, right? Mm -hmm. to, to manifest his mission in the world to bring blessing to the nations. But he's going to have to represent this God accurately. He needs to come to know this God. And the story of Abraham, you can read it in terms of a, a man coming to understand something more about this deity who he doesn't know much about. He comes from a pagan culture. He knows about pagan deities, mm -hmm. and lots of different Mesopotamian deities and lots of Canaanite deities and so forth. So when God says, take your son, your only son, and sacrifice him, he could think, that's just what kid, that's what deities do. They want to, you to prove your commitment. So in one sense, it's not that shocking. In another sense, it is a son. So it would, it would be a serious sacrifice. I'm giving up something important, right, to me. So I th the way I read it is the test is not whether, you know, at the end, um, the Abraham says, stop. Now I know you fear God because you've not withheld your son, your only son from me. So that Abraham fears God is like this, the, 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 um, the student getting a C on the exam. That's the outcome. But God didn't want him just to fear God. Uh, somebody who feared a pagan God would sacrifice their child. But I think that what God is doing is testing two things. And the test is not just to see if this is the case. It's to cause it to be the case. So you study for a test, you become better knowledgeable about the material, right? Mm -hmm. And when the question comes, you bring together knowledge you have, and you can actually say more than you thought you knew, because the test brings out something in you. And that's what testing is like in the Bible. It brings out something. So the test is, prime. first of all, can you discern that I am not just like the gods of the pagans? I'm a God who is merciful. I don't require child sacrifice. And if Abraham would have said, Lord, you don't want me to kill my child. Really, do you? That's not the kind of God you are. God would have said, A plus, brother. You just mm. passed with flying colors. But the other part of the test is, take your son Isaac. Because Abraham has shown in the previous narrative, if you read carefully, that he really cares about Ishmael, but has no feelings for Isaac whatsoever. Mm. Sarah cares about Isaac. Abraham cares about Ishmael. The very reason Sarah sent Hagar and Ishmael away, she was afraid that Ishmael would actually get the inheritance, not Isaac, because Abraham basically favors Ishmael. A number of places in the text suggest that. So take your son, your only son, Isaac. You love him, don't you? Hmm. And go kill him. Hmm. Would that prod Abraham to say, hey, 
God, you can't want me to kill my son. And that would start to develop a bond between him and Abraham, Isaac. So it would actually bring out some love and create some love that had been missing before because he was not bonded with his son the way the narrative shows it. So primarily he's being tested for discernment of the character of God. Secondarily, he's being tested for his love for his son. There is nothing in the Bible that suggests to me that dedication to God should be in conflict with love for your children, mm -hmm. except the way this story is traditionally read. And that's highly problematic. And of course, the outcome of the story is that he does fear God. That's better than saying, God, screw you. I'm not going to do what you want. That's mm -hmm. disobedience. So he gets a C or he barely passes. He gets graded on a curve or something you could say, because God doesn't give up on him. God continues with him. But Isaac does not return down the mountain. We're told that the two of them walked together at the mountain, but we're told that Abraham returned to his servants and he went to Beersheba. And at the end of the story, and this is in the book, um, Sarah is living in Haran. Abraham is living in Beersheba. So is Hagar. Mm -hmm. Isaac is living in Beher Laharoi. They're not in the same place. It's a broken family. Mm -hmm. This family is not the way it's supposed to be. Is that what God actually wants? And not only is Isaac not living with his father after that, the, the son, Jacob, makes a covenant with Laban, his uncle, in the name of the God of his father, Abraham, and the name of the God of his father, Isaac. And what is the name of, his, of Isaac's God? The fear of Isaac. Because that's what Jacob learned from his father about God. You run scared of this deity because he tries to kill you. Mm. And of course, he's also alienated from his father because his father didn't try and protect him. Yeah. So that's what I think is going on in this story. Mm -hmm. There's a tradition, rabbinical tradition, that that Sarah, hearing that what had happened is when she died, right? Yeah. Is that the, yeah. the next time Sarah is mentioned in the narrative is her death. Right. So that so that what the rabbinics they love to fill in the gaps. They say what happened to Isaac in the three years between Moriah and when he meets. Um, his wife, because mm -hmm. Abraham sends a servant to find the wife. Abraham never meets Isaac again. In that three years, something that he was taken to the Garden of Eden to heal of his wounds. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that, that's do. one of the rabbinic traditions. And then the other one is because Sarah appears, the next thing she appears, she dies. That's because she heard what Abraham tried to do to Isaac and she right. died. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, they, they're definitely, when you're reading the <laughs> rabbinic literature, you have to be on notice that there's a lot of filling in the gaps. Yeah. A lot of stuff. And, that, and they do it different rabbis fill in the gaps different ways. Right. You know? Right. Well, that's yeah. why I'm always wary when, when people quote the, the ancient rabbis as authoritative, because yeah. I'm always like, well, they're, they're a good source of how people have approached the text, but like, you know, yeah. they do fill it in different ways and yeah. a lot of it becomes speculation. But the idea that this event broke or shattered the family is one that does not get a lot of mention outside of the commentaries. And for some people I, reading it, they've yeah. probably never heard that before hearing not this interview. Ma not many commentaries mention it either, to be honest. Mm -hmm. It's quite so, rare. Yeah. So you, let me, let me give a quick, what jumped in my mind when you were speaking was a possible, cause I always like to think of possible pushbacks or possible exceptions. And when you talk about, you said, God, love for God never is asked to be exercised in a way that conflicts with love for family. Not intrinsically, not intrinsically. Yes. There may be times when it does conflict, yes. Right. So then how how would you incorporate when Jesus says to be my disciple, hate you your mother hate and father? Your brother, yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how, do yeah. You mix the, how do you make those two texts work together? Right. And not I, I, yeah. So I think that what it's saying is you, you're not supposed to. So, you know, uh, yeah. You're not, you're not supposed to elevate commitment to your family over dedication to God. Mm -hmm. um, that's pretty clear in the Bible. Commitment to nothing should ever be elevated above commitment to God. But that doesn't mean that God says you should go and kill your family as in a holy jihad to prove that you're dedicated to me. That is not something the Bible actually endorses. <laughs> right, right. And so, so everybody who interprets um, the, the Genesis 22 text in the traditional way says it's a one-off. Mm -hmm. But then that asks, why is it a one-off? It's only a one-off if Abraham needed to cut his ties with Isaac because he was too attached to him and it was getting in the way of his allegiance to God. But it wasn't. He had no attachment to Isaac whatsoever. Hmm. So, so on all kind of exegetical bases, reading in context, the traditional reading doesn't actually make sense. 
Mm. And you would say, to clarify, when God says, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, that that is uh, 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 ironic or that's like God being like, he's not literally, Abraham it's, it's doesn't. An, it's ahead, an encouragement. Just... It's an encouragement. Many people have pointed out that the grammatical structure of the Hebrew is different. Take your, every time you have an object of a verb in Hebrew, you have a direct object marker, um, et in Hebrew, mm. you know, um, take your son, it's got a direct object marker, your only one direct object marker, whom you love is a relative phrase, it doesn't have the direct object marker, then Isaac with a direct object marker. So that phrase stands out even grammatically, and people have speculated, why is it different that way? Mm. And I think it's, it's a rhetorical exhortation. So if I was going to have a, a movie or a drama, I would have God saying, Abraham, Abraham, you know, yes, Lord, here I am, take your son, please, your only one, you love him, right? And go and sacrifice him on the mountain. And Abraham would reflect on, do I really love him? Mm -hmm. Nah, I don't care that much. Yeah, I'll go do that. You know, mm -hmm. I, I might work it out that way. You'd, you'd experiment with different ways. Right, but I'll right. put it as, a, as an encouragement. You love him, don't you? Yeah. There are so many times in the Bible, and this is what I never appreciated until I learned Hebrew, was there are so many stories in the Bible like this, that if you read it with one tone, or read it with another tone, it's almost a different story. Yes. And I think most English readers don't fully appreciate that. How can people who want to follow you or read your works or engage with you in any way that you prefer, uh, if you want to give any kind of plug for that, this would be the time to do it. How could people find out more about Richard Middleton and his work? So if you go to jrichardmiddleton.com, it's a WordPress blog. I don't blog a whole lot right now. I don't have much time because I'm writing other things right now. Um, but you can go there and you can find PDFs of most articles I've written and links to all the books. Um, you can find a lot of information about me. There's a contact form. You can always contact me and I'll email you back. I actually always email people back. I may not be able to fully answer your questions. People have all kinds of weird, strange questions, but <laughs> I'll try my best and we'll connect. And then you'll get my email through that and we can talk mm -hmm. further. That's wonderful. Folks, I want to encourage you check out, if you haven't, Abraham Silence, um, Richard's books on eschatology, just everything. Yeah, read his stuff. He's one of the scholars that I am fortunate that we are connected through Facebook and, and have been introduced to his work. I have benefited tremendously. And I know if you are a typical viewer of Disciple Dojo, this is one of the people that I think you should know. And that's why I wanted to have him here. Um, so you could meet and hear his sweet Jamaican accent. How fun is that? So I'm going to have you just come on and read random things sometimes just because it's nice hearing it. <laughs> uh, when I, when I taught two courses in Jamaica, I taught them entirely in Jamaican dialect. <laughs> I bet. Totally. Was... You wouldn't have understood. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I, I, I have traveled in, in the Caribbean. Is that right? All right, man. Yeah. Right. A couple of places. And in each place I've gone to, Yes, there's been tourist English that they speak to me, and then there's been what they speak to each other. Yeah, and code switching, man. You can code switch yeah. so quickly. <laughs> wow.